Welcome to the podcast for the West Side Church of Christ that meets in Killeen, Texas. Today we bring you another practical lesson from God's inspired word, the Bible. Good morning, everyone. If you would open your Bibles to John chapter 3. And we're not going to read verse 16. Now everybody knows that God so loved the world He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believed in Him would not perish but would have everlasting life. Super important verse. I want to go a little past that. That has been talked about by Jesus and then they get into an, a, a, another discussion in verse 25. John 3 verse 25. We'll read down through verse 26. A new discussion arose between some of John's disciples and the Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, he's talking about Jesus, Uh, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You read passages like this, and of course John is referring to Jesus. John has this special relationship. They are literally related, remember, they're cousins. And then John has been chosen as this speaker, this precursor, to bring about people's recognition that this guy is in fact the Christ. And they wondered, of course, at John's perfect willingness to decline in fame and power and whatever, influence because he knew that his job was done he knew that the one who had come was as he said above all thank nathaniel for leading that song not just that song but all the other songs because he took that and figured out probably what i was going to be talking about and all the other songs were leading us in the direction that jesus christ is in fact above all Brian said the same thing in the discussion regarding the Lord's Supper. And so John here underscores the fact the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that He comes from heaven, and therefore stands above us all, that He rules. And those who are of the earth, that is us, John himself, we, we're different. We don't get to be above. We're, we're the below, actually, right? We're the ones who look up to the one who was above. And so he's the one, this one who comes from above, who is above all. We'll read some other passages that help us, again, see this. He sits or stands, depending on the image that you're given, above all of us, above the earth, and therefore he must be obeyed. John said it. We need to believe in him in order to have eternal life, but those who don't obey him will not. They will not see life. They only have wrath. Those two things are synonymous. Believing in Him is obeying Him. can't separate the two. Now, Paul said much the same thing. Uh, I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 1. I would also, we're not going to read it, but I would turn your attention to Colossians chapter 1 as well, where Paul makes this very same point. But uh, in Ephesians 1, let's read in verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, 
I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, for above all rule, and I'm sorry, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. There's a long sentence. But you see that? Jesus is above all these other things. He goes on, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the God, the God, the Father, our Father, put this Son, Jesus, in charge of everything, and he is above all authorities and powers and so on, and he is also head of the church. And so, again, read Colossians chapter 1, you'll see the same kind of stuff there that Paul talks about. What's the point, though? What does this mean? Well, I think we all know the answer to this. But it's so important, like all of the truth, that it bears repeating anyway. Since Christ is the head of the church, and he is above all authority and power and dominion, it means that we absolutely must obey him. We must follow him. We must love him. Again, you all know this, but it bears repeating. I'm reminded, and, and I was just thinking about that as we're singing the songs, which was delivering this exact same message, and then Brian's comments regarding the Lord's Supper and the supremacy of Christ in our salvation, and I'm thinking maybe I should just get up here and say, we're done. Except then I remember the Old Testament, the book of Judges, and the prophets going over and over and over, saying the same things over and over and over. Why? Because we don't get it. And we need to be reminded over and over and over of these important things, these concepts that absolutely matter. So that's what we're doing this morning. So, a couple of things first. We need to follow him. That should go without saying, but here it is, right? Jesus said so. Because of he, he being who he is, and me being who I am, and you being who you are, we must follow him. There's no other way to go. I mean, we can choose to not to. That's our choice. And as John said, then that's fine, but you then forfeit eternal life. And I hope that no one in here wants to do that. So we follow him. Jesus said in Luke 9, you know this passage well, verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. So think about this, all of this, in terms of this idea that he is above all. There's nothing you can put up there that, that is uh, going to be above him. God has put everything there for Jesus to be above, right? So we can't find something, some way to insert in there. So, he's the one we have to follow. Jesus said, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or and forfeits himself or loses himself? What profit is there? Well, there may be a profit here in this life, but then that's it. I would argue that's not even true. We lose so much when we don't follow the Lord. But Jesus is very clear on what it costs to be one of his disciples, and that is to deny ourselves. That is to make him first. We follow him. Where he goes, we go. Where he directs, we go. What he says, we do. Because he is our master. 
He is our Lord. We make that confession when we say, as we become children of God in that process where we, we, we start to believe that he is in fact the Son of God, we make that confession, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, my Master. And then we, of course, repent of our sins and we become baptized for the remission of those sins. That's how we connect to that blood that Brian was talking about here earlier. We make that admission that we will follow him. Jesus said that you, you, to do that, we have to deny ourselves. It's very difficult. And so, other passages, of course, that relate to this, like Matthew 6 and verse 31. We have to choose the kingdom first. Right? Not just choose the kingdom. You Texans can relate to this. Are you a Texas citizen first or an American citizen first? Maybe that matters. Other people have to make choices like that. What am I going to be when it all comes down to it and everything else is stripped away? What am I going to be? Well, am I going to be a child of God or something else? Am I going to be in this kingdom or something else? Jesus said this, Do not be anxious, verse 31, Matthew 6, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? So again, those are normal behaviors that every human being must actually go through. We do have to eat, and we do have to live, wear clothes, and we do have to live somewhere, all those things. So, what's important here? Well, don't worry about the, that stuff. The Gentiles seek after that, and your Heavenly Father knows you need them, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and these things will be added to you. He's saying, don't make that your first priority, even though those are absolutely built into the way He made us. Think about that. We have to have food, clothing, and shelter. All right, that is the, if you've ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's this pyramid thing. That is at the bottom. And if you don't have that, you don't care about the rest. You don't care about safety or self-actualization or any of those other things because you're starving to death or you're freezing to death. You're dying. God built us this way, and yet he still says, you know what? Seek first the kingdom of God, and that stuff, you'll be, you'll be okay. I was not making a blanket statement that you won't die or you won't suffer, none of that. He's simply saying, don't make those the things that are the priority in your life. They'll be taken care of one way or another. Seek first the kingdom of God, even in something as basic and fundamental as food, clothing, and shelter. So everything else that comes after that, seek first the kingdom of God. Thinking about safety, thinking about uh, you know, wealth, thinking about, again, maybe self-actualization and all those things, they're real. And they're important to us. But if in all of those we would say, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God, we'll be where we need to be. God will help us out. But remember, the, the, the issue here is denying ourselves and following Jesus will then require us to seek first the kingdom of God. So when there's a choice, when there's a decision, first comes the kingdom of God. First comes the kingdom of God. First comes the kingdom of God. We have to obey even sometimes when, it's, when it hurts, even when maybe it's not in our best personal interest. And of course, I always think of Acts 5, right? Here are the disciples who Jesus died and they kind of don't know what to do. And then uh, now, you know, seven weeks later, the day of Pentecost happens, the Spirit descends on the twelve and they begin speaking in tongues. And they, they then realize what all this was about. And they went about their business. And now they're going about teaching. And in chapter 4, these same guys had been arrested and sort of uh, punished and told to be quiet. And then they, they don't. They keep preaching Jesus. Why? Because they're seeking first the kingdom of God and they're following. They're denying themselves and they're following him. In chapter 5, verse 27, when they had brought them, they, they get arrested again. It's hard for us to imagine, I think, in this country, like being arrested for preaching the truth. You know, right now that typically doesn't happen, but it could. What are we going to do? Well, they got arrested. Their leadership, the people they've looked up to their whole lives, said, stop. We told you to stop doing this, right? They said, 
uh, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with all your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Peter and the apostles said, we must obey God rather than men. That's what following Jesus means. In whatever the situation, whatever the case, of seeking first the kingdom and deciding that I'm going to do what's right, I'm going to do what Jesus said, no matter what. No matter what my government says, no matter what my boss says, no matter what my conscience says or my heart says, I'm going to do what God says. That's how we follow Jesus. Because he's above all. There's really no other answer to that. He's done all this stuff for us. But he's above all. We also could talk about loving God, of course. This should follow as well. Because of everything he's done. So we follow him, we serve him, because he literally is the only one who we can serve and actually succeed and thrive. But because he is above all, no one else is. Anything else we choose to serve is really just serving ourselves, right? We can argue we're serving Satan, whatever. All Satan cares about is that we don't serve the Lord. It's the same thing. Jesus was asked, of course, in Matthew, it's recorded here in Matthew 22, what the greatest commandment was. You're familiar with this one as well. Verse 34 the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, which they were happy about, right? They were, th they were like, he got them, but we're going to get him. That's what they're doing, okay? They gathered, and they, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. So they want to see. They want to see what Jesus would say, where he is, and how can they get him? They think they're smarter than Jesus. Well, they went to school, and they did all the stuff, and they have the education. Who's Jesus? Some carpenter's son from nowhere, right? Except he's not. He's the son of God. He's above us all. He's above them. They just don't recognize this yet. So they said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That kind of sounds like, again, the idea of above all, right? So not only do we have to follow Jesus above all other things, we also have to love God Jesus, and Jesus above all other things, right? And this can be hard. Well, he went on, he said, well, this is the, great, the first, the greatest commandment, which he's just quoting from Deuteronomy. It's nothing new. Pharisees, Sadducees, and everybody have been sort of arguing about this for 1,500 years probably, just knowing people, right? Well, what's the, what's the greatest, most important thing? You and I don't have to argue about this, because Jesus just told us what it is. It is to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Everything else, everything that God did, depends on this idea of love. And we're not going to go and spend the whole rest of the lesson on love. Read 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to get there in class soon. We just finished studying it for a whole you know, spring and summer in our Friday night Bible class. You've read it a hundred times. And in the beginning of that chapter, Paul said, without love, nothing else really matters. And so we need to love the Lord above all. But he also said, love your, love your neighbor. I think a, a passage in 1 Peter chapter 4 suits us here. Verse 7. And here's another reason why I'm up here preaching to you regularly is because Peter did this too. Peter recognized that they already heard all the stuff that he's about to write to them. And he told them, but I need to tell you again anyway because that's because you need it that's the job because it's important stuff so here the end of all things is at hand first peter 4 verse 7 that sounds ominous right the end of all things is at hand I mean, like we're in those days that's how they saw everything jesus came he died he was resurrected and he said the kingdom's here and from this point forward the end is here it's right around the corner now for us it's been two thousand years but it's right around the corner. We're in it. Right? Therefore, be self-controlled. 
sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since the love covers the multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Again, to him belong all that. Not to me, not to you, not to anyone else. To him. And we, in part, continue that process by, of course, loving and taking care of one another. It's important. It's humongously important that we love God and we love one another. And he gave us some some practical ways in which we could do that. Things like hospitality and you know not complaining and taking care of our stuff, that kind of thing. But we need to remember this too, that as much as we need to love one another and so on, they still don't take precedence over loving God. And where this really gets us is with our family, right? With our family. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Great crowds accompanied him, Jesus, and he turned and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. Think about that. Have you ever like, just really stopped and read that and thought about that, what Jesus is saying? Put that together with what we read, read in chapter 9 about denying ourselves and following him. And, and again, this is the most natural thing in the way that we were built. God created Adam and Eve to be a couple and to make a family. And that is how it is supposed to go. And it's right. And he said, even that, even that cannot come before your love for God and for the Lord. Again, just like the food, clothing, and shelter, we can't choose that first. We choose the kingdom first. We choose a love for God first, even over our family. And we make all kinds of excuses, maybe, to not do that. And so this means, all of this put together, we have to follow Jesus. We have to love Jesus. With, you know, everything is involved here. This means we have to be totally committed to Jesus. Like Jesus was totally committed. That's why he didn't sin. Because remember, he decided to do everything that God said. You and I don't make that decision, unfortunately. It's an inherent flaw. Jesus was so committed, he went to the cross, even though at least part of him said, I don't want to do this, knowing how awful it was going to be. Something that you and I have not had to face, that kind of thing. And yet he went anyway. He went willingly. Someone was committed. We've all you know, heard about people who are committed to a cause and they will give their lives. That's getting closer to what we're talking about. And we've talked about this idea before. Sometimes it's easier to go ahead and die for something than to keep living for something, right? Because then it's over. And if you have confidence in salvation, it should be fairly easy to die for something. And yet, how hard is it to keep living? And so let's think about this idea of commitment for a few minutes. I'm going to give you three kind of examples. One, I want, to, I want us to think about commitment, what it means, again, being connected and true and... Uh, busy at the work, all those sort of things that commitment brings. So let's think about this. Are you committed to, you know, the available things, the easy things that there are to attain, like wisdom? You say, wait, wisdom's hard. Actually, no. Proverbs tells us that wisdom's out there on the street corner yelling to get our attention, and yet we still don't pay attention to her. The fact is God's Word is available everywhere. You don't even have to know how to read. Because some machine or some person will read it to you and be happy to do it. Ephesians 5, verse 15. 
This is a command. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is a command for us to do something that is 100% easily available. Isn't it? It's not hard to find it. I'm not saying there aren't hard questions. I'm not saying there aren't hard discussions. There are. If you've been here very long, you know that's true. But it's there. And so we, I think we need to ask ourselves some questions. What prevents you from reading, studying, discussing those kind of things? The things that wisdom has put out there for us to have all the time. I mean, what prevents you from accessing all of that information on a very regular basis? The, the, the answer to that is nothing except what you put in front of that, right? And so the next question then is, whatever those things are that are preventing us or keeping us from reading, studying, discussing the Word of God, and again, gaining the wisdom from it, are those things then in keeping with following and loving the Lord? You know the answer to that question is no. So why do we keep doing this? Why do we, and I, I, I include myself in this sometimes too. Why? How about this? How about hard things? There are very difficult things out there that yet to be committed means we have to commit ourselves to these things. And again, Brian brought this up. In his talk this morning, this was a component of some of the songs we sung, this idea of total transformation. Romans 12, verse 1. Transformation is hard. It's physically hard, because if it was physically easy, everybody would look like a supermodel or a bodybuilder. The fact is, it's hard. If it was easy, everybody would just look good. <laughs> right? None of us would be like, oh, I'm too weak, or I don't have enough muscles, or I, you know, I have too much fat. None of us would be doing that because it'd be easy to deal with. The fact is, it's not. Because transformation physically is hard. Mentally, it's hard. Spiritually, it's hard. We would all deal with, you know, our own challenges, right? All the baggage and nonsense we've lived through in our life. We would deal with that easy if it was that easy, but it's not. We would easily be able to do the things God wants us to do if it was that easy, but it's not. And yet here we are again, myself included, needing to be reminded of these things. So Romans 12, verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, service, I think is actually a better word that could go there. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you might dis may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we've already seen, right? We need to invest in what the will of God is. Here we need to be transformed by it and practice it. What prevents you from being transformed, from changing, from sacrificing? Well, again, nothing except what you or I put in front of that service and love for God. Nothing. So the things that are there are the things we're putting there, right? And again, we ask the same question. How does having those things in between this transformation process, how are those things in keeping with following and loving the Lord? They're not. So we need to remove those things. And then thirdly and finally, what about simple things? Like assembling together regularly. Here we go. Sorry, it's simple. I don't get it. It says right here in Hebrews 10, 24, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, uh, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What prevents you from doing that? Going to church, Bible classes, whatever other sort of church gatherings we might have or whatever ways. Again, Bobby talked about that this morning in his prayer. Those are important things. That also, by the way, is a command, just like the thing we read in Romans 12 or the thing we read in Ephesians 5. Those are commands. 
And when you put it next to the idea of being tra transformed and really digging deep and really changing, it should be easy to just show up. Again, what prevents you from doing those things and whatever that is, how is that something that's in keeping with following and loving the Lord? Well, I got this reason. Well, is that a biblical, scriptural reason? I got this thing to do. I got to do this with this family. We just read about that one. I got to do this. The question that we want to really think about is, are we committed? This was some kind of sales thing that I just ran across. Are we committed or interested, right? We're interested. We're, we're sniffing around. We're kind of talking about it. Like, the, yeah, that sounds cool. I want to join this club or I want to start working out or whatever. I want to go to school. And, and it's fine until it gets hard or until we're asked to do something we don't want to do or until we're asked to commit more time than we want to commit, right? And then all of a sudden, eh, I'm really not, I'm not, you find out, right? I'm not committed to that. That's why, again, we see very few people who look like bodybuilders or supermodels, very few people who, you know, really know everything they can about Scripture, very few people who really, uh, you know, put themselves out there as much as possible because it is very, it is hard. I'm not suggesting that this should just be something we wake up one morning. What I'm asking us to do is think through what it is that's getting in the way of following and loving the Lord. And for each one of us, these will be different things, but none of them, none of them uh, are in keeping with following and loving the Lord. None of them show that we are committed. They all show that we're interested. Maybe we like the idea of being a Christian, kind of like we like the idea of being all muscular. Most guys do. But yet, what does it take to get there? Well, a whole lot of work. A whole lot of time. A whole lot of investment. A whole lot of commitment. And so we want to ask this big question before we close and sing our closing song. Does your life, if you were to look at your life right now, does it look like, because remember, we're told to be lights of the world and salt of the earth, we're supposed to be shining examples, we're supposed to reflect Jesus in our lives. So if people looked at you right now, would they see someone who is committed to following and loving the Lord, or would they see someone who's interested don't get me wrong, interest, interest is good. Far too many people are simply not. We've got to move past that level and actually get involved. Or maybe they just see someone who's just going through the motion. I don't know. Again, you need to ask that question for yourself. We're going to sing Live for Jesus, which is exactly what this lesson's ultimately about. He is above all. You and I are here of the earth. We are servants. We need to serve the Lord. So you want eternal life? You need to serve the Lord, period. You need to be more than just interested in serving the Lord. So let's think about these things. We're going to sing the song, and again, those of us in the audience here, we've heard this before. I know I have. All of us have been guilty here and there, at least, of violating this principle. So the question really is, what are we going to do now? Is it the past? Is the past? It doesn't matter. What are you going to do now? We need to live for Jesus. But maybe you're, you're thinking, I need more help than that. I need more help than just, i got to really buckle down and start disciplining. Great. Ask us. Ask for help. Let us know how we can help you. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. We'll study with you. We'll help you keep accountable. Whatever it is. Or maybe you're realizing, I'm not even really on the Lord's side yet anyway. I haven't confessed my faith and repented of my sins and been baptized. We'd love to help you with those things too because that, that is the critical first step. Without those steps, not really there anyway. So we would want to help you with that too. But whatever the, the need is, if it's such, let us know as we stand and sing. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have. If you are ever in the Colleen area, 
we'd certainly love to have you worship with us. You can learn more about us and our times of worship at westsidecolleen.com. Tune in next time and be sure to subscribe to our podcast. All together worthy, all together wonderful too.